All righty. Buenos, buenos dias todos. I'm in California today, so good morning and afternoon for those on the East Coast. I'm Gabe Rodriguez, chair of the New America Alliance. Welcome to today's town hall with our special guest, Republican State Senator of California, Roselicie Ochoa Bo. For 20 plus years, the NA has been advocating for the interests of Latinos and other diverse professionals and ensured the participation of our community at the highest level across business, public service, academia, and nonprofit leadership. The purpose of today's call is for our membership to get to know the Senator and vice versa. Here's a fun fact. Senator Ochoa Bo was the only Republican to support the California pension bill, AB 890, so thank you. Next, we will hear from our fearless CEO, Solange Fernandez Brooks, followed by the Q&A segment moderated by Dolores Munoz. Thank you and excited to get started. Please Solange, take it away. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, well, welcome everybody to our town hall with uh, Senator Rosie Lisi. Lisi, ah, I messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Rosie Lisi uh, Ochoa Bog. Uh, thank you very much. Now, to get things going, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to our moderator, who is Dolores Munoz. And as you know, she's the chairwoman of the NAA Institute. Thank you. Take it away, Dolores. Sorry about that, guys. Thank you. So let's start this again. My apologies. My apologies to you too, Senator. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to State Senator Rosalicia Ochoa Bogue. Senator Ochoa Bogue is a native Californian and the daughter of Mexican migrants. A, as a successful leader, she credits her family with teaching her personal responsibility, the value of education, and hard work. I am sure she makes her family proud. In November of 2020, the nearly 1 million people of California Senate District 23, a district in Southern California, elected her to represent them at the California State Legislature in Sacramento. Since then, Senator Ochoa Bo has been appointed Vice Chair of the Committees on Education, Banking and Financial Institutions, Labor, Public Employment and Retirement, and public safety. She is also a member of the committees on budget and fiscal review, business, professions and economic development, and housing. She is a mover and a shaker, a woman of action. Throughout her career, Senator Ochoa Bogue has been a champion for stronger schools, lower taxes, better infrastructure, and more affordable home prices because she is a strong believer of home ownership. Senator Ochoa Bog, we are honored and pleased to have you have joined us for our town hall with our membership and guests. Before we start our formal questions and answer, answer session, um, <clears throat> I'd love to hear your thoughts on how Latinos have contributed to our country and why and how can we as business leaders and policymakers do to help more Latinos achieve the American dream? Wonderful question. So I would begin with um, just sharing a little bit about my background um, as far as our family and immigrating to this country. My grandfather actually arrived, we believe, in the late 50s, early 60s um, under the Bracero program that allowed him to come um, to the United States to uh, work seasonally and then go back home uh, to Mexico. And my family's from Medida, Yucatan. And, uh, and my, my grandmother used to, she stayed there for many, many years with, um, at the time, several of her children. Eventually, after many years, uh, it was difficult. My, I think my grandmother was pregnant with her seventh child. And she said, okay, Justino, this is not gonna work. Um, you know, you're either gonna have to come back to, the, to Mexico and, and find something here locally, or we're going to have to uh, go to the States with you. Um, my grandfather was a um, tailor um, back home. And so was my grandmother um, as well as a teacher, um, but they really couldn't make ends meet. And so 
um, coming to the United States provided a great opportunity for them. Um, eventually, the sponsor that my grandfather had sponsored my grandmother and five of her seven children at the time because two were um, uh, aged out, they were adults. Eventually, they also immigrated with their with well, one of them with their family and the other one was not married. But my dad was 16 when he immigrated to this country. He attended local high schools, graduated from a community college, eventually went to work for a hotel and then worked himself up um, towards management. Eventually, um, his, his dream, his dream was to own a, a restaurant. And he went through culinary school and eventually owned, with the help of his sisters, was able to gather enough money and open his restaurant here in the United States. I share that with you because um, when it comes to Latinos, we have contributed so much to, to the United States. Um, there's a reason why so many people from uh, around the world, all over La La Latino America, um, come to, and not just Latino America, but in, in the case, you know, with the audience here, um, I'm going to just refer to the Latinos that decide to either immigrate or migrate to the country, to this country. And it's because they're looking for economic opportunity, economic mobility. And this country, when we hear about it, when we see pictures around the world, when people look to this country, they see a beacon of hope, they see a beacon of opportunity. And that's what drives people to want to come um, for uh, towards this country, whether it's economic, uh, as I said, economic opportunity or mobility or safety uh, for their families. Sorry. No, no, no. Thank no, you for no. that passionate response. That everybody else, you know, many of us on this call share similar similar backgrounds, and you know, has been a journey. But you know, what you are now voice and as a Latina, you know, we're so proud of you and, and everything that you have accomplished. Community. So, so when I look at this country, I really do see a lot of opportunity. Unfortunately, um, there are a lot of impediments once we get here about what can and cannot be done. There's many systems that we have in this country that are broken, and we have to be honest about the discussions that we have. And it's one of the reasons why I'm such an advocate for having all stakeholders at the table when we're working on policy and not just representing one group and really giving different perspectives on the, um, on the discussions. And um, it's hard sometimes, you know, in, in California, because in the legislature, we're very few, we're the super, super minority as Republicans, as you may or may not know. Um, out of the 40 senators in the California state legislature, only nine of us are Republican. I'm the first Latina Republican to be elected to the, in the history of California, to be elected to the California state legislature. And I bring a different perspective. Um, and I, I'm grateful because I have a caucus, a Republican caucus that's very supportive of, um, on my voice, on the concerns I express, the policies that I support, do not support. And um, I have an open dialogue with my colleagues on the other side when they bring policies. And I say, well, let's, let's be honest and fair, or you know, what about this? perspective and or that angle in which we can view policy but I try to be as fair and just about policy objective I think I'm grateful for the fact that I've had so many life opportunities that allow me to have different perspectives whether it's as a teacher teaching English language learners um, as a parent who volunteer in different capacities throughout the school um, um, environment including ultimately as a school board member grateful for the fact that we come from uh, both my husband's side of the family my side of the family come from small businesses and how they're affected by the um, the regulatory environment that we have in California I'm grateful to have worked with the local uh, the board president um, or chairperson for a local chamber of commerce and how the businesses the local businesses really um, are the backbone for many of our communities who employ local uh, youth and um, and community members. So, um, as Latinos, I think we are we provide so much from you know harvesting the food, planting the food um, that we're going to eat, to harvesting, to owning businesses, to teaching at our local universities. The Latinos are so incredibly hardworking as a culture. We're very family oriented. Um, we're very driven many of us, and we have to assure 
that um, as they um, migrate or immigrate to this country, that we really, and our current, our first, second generations and third generations, that we really focus on empowering them. I am I'm a huge advocate of education as a means of empowerment. And when you're empowered, you feel more compelled to be engaged. And so um, that's one of the reasons why I'm so readily available to speak to our youth groups. I'm back in my high school um, that I graduated from here in San Marino High School, making sure that I'm building the relationships with my local youth, um, with our scouting programs, um, but because they need to see that everything is possible. We all have adversity. We all have faced challenges. We all have, well, I'm not, not sure if everybody has, but I know I have suffered uh, poverty. I've, I know what it is not to have money. I know what it's like not to have a home. But I also know the merits of hard work, personal responsibility, discipline, and having a certain sense of values that allow us to move forward in this amazing country if we really partake and really own those, those opportunities. So um, that's where I come from. That's what I believe that the Latinos have provided for this country. And they really are an amazing integral part of who we are as America. Thank you for that, Senator. I was about to get up and start you know, clapping. So thank you so much for that. Um, thank you for, you know, your candor and um, just, you know, your, your inspiration to, to many. So thank you. Um, next, I will turn it over to David Pollack with reverence. Senator, thank you so much for participating here with the NAA. Thank you for your comments. I have a question that um, I'm sure you've heard from before, but when you look at the statistics coming out of COVID, it's pretty dramatic, right? The top 1%, those of us on this call and higher, have done better, never have done better, have been increasing incomes. And at the same time, many of us still, you know, working from the comfort of our own homes, talking about how work has changed when in fact work has really only changed for a small sliver of society and most people have to go to work every day. And when you think about the folks who've been at the front lines at working out during the pandemic, who've been at the most risk of, of getting sick, people that have taken our garbage or drive our, our buses or you know even airline pilots and, and shipping captains, right? It doesn't, it's, it's those people who are most at risk. And so when you look at the discrepancy in what's happening to their incomes between those of us who are comfortable at home and those who are at risk at work. What, what programs, policies, initiatives um, is the government doing to try and bring those people along as we exit the pandemic? Well, I can speak to the fact in California, there's been a lot of policy that has been supported um, in our legislature that gives um, ample time for family members to take care of other family members when they are sick. There's been a lot of accommodations to extending the, the uh, sick leave for people that are suffering from COVID. Um, there's a problem, there's a caveat that I saw there um, on, on that end, which was that sometimes, and we have to look at the impact also, it's got to be a fine balance and it's very hard um, to get that balance, I think, unless you have both sides at the table. But making sure that people have the time when they're sick to, when they're actually sick, symptomatically sick, um, to be able to stay home and then be able to, to care for those who are actually sick, such as their children. But also the other problem that we've had that it has affected much of the, both the workers and the businesses are the fact that, um, the health department hasn't been very clear about when people um, were needed to be out and not exposed or not at work versus um, when they were symptomatically sick and actually be able to stay home. There's been a lot of discrepancy on, on, on that front, which has put people out of work for just being exposed to someone who, you know, was in the same classroom or in the same um, office and not getting sick. And just because you were exposed, you were taken away and, and taken off the, um, the payroll or not the payroll because you would still get, get your sick leave, but taken off of being able to work. So um, there's some policy there that has been hindering our, 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 our workforce. 
And it also has imp impacted our small businesses. I've been meeting with a lot of our local uh, businesses where they're not working at full capacity because we're not getting people to go back to work. So there's something there that's kind of broken that we got to figure out what is disincentivizing people from coming back to work at full capacity. Um, so that's something that we need to work right. As far as the financial, are you talking about the financial impact? I want to make sure I have your, your question clear. Yeah, no. I mean, when you look at the statistics, the top 1% get got much, much richer uh, and their incomes have gone up during the COVID period. And the other, it's certainly at least the bottom half, if not greater than the bottom half, has had their incomes go down. So what, what policies are there to address those people who are at the very uh, health risk that you just identified to help, help bring them out of this situation of falling farther and far, farther behind in terms of income inequality? Um, you know, I have to think about that question in particular um, with our, because I'm not sure, there's some things that I, that I saw. So let me, let me backtrack a little bit as far as government contracts and how that has impacted, um, you know, many companies, including um, companies that are foreign to our, to our, to our state or to our country. Um, let me just give California and just talk with realms of California. Something that was brought up to my attention was that when we were under the emergency orders um, in California, which we still are, by the way, we're still under emergency orders, many of the contracts that were awarded um, to companies that were providing PPEs throughout the state um, in that need were um, not even bidded out. They were just kind of awarded. And they were awarded to, to companies that were not necessarily California-based companies. And so it actually initiated one of the one of the pieces of policy that I tried to initiate this year, which was um, to be able to, to designate or, or have a box in our application process where people could say, we have a business in California that manufactures X, Y, and Z that we could provide or we have a, um, a manufacturing company in California that produces one, two, and three. And so that, in my opinion, was an opportunity to make sure that um, uh, contracts were considered here in California first, not necessarily mandated to use them, but at least know that we could support our local economy, which provides opportunities for everyone. Um, as far as the um, the... So let me, let me backtrack a little bit. So when we're awarding contracts to companies that you know, are very familiar to us or very, um, we know the owners or we are affiliated with them in one way or another, it's going to impact our, you know, it's going to have a preferential um, impact on certain individuals and industries, which is why I'm very much open to the free market to be able to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to bid on, on contracts and be able to have um, the opportunity to get those contracts awarded, which is quite why I'm kind of n nervous and very hesitant about extending those um, executive powers beyond the actual need of what it's supposed to be intended for. The impact, the economic impact on those, so the reason I bring that up is because that's, that's why many one percenters have had an edge, I believe, is because they've had industries that have really benefited from people uh, from this pandemic, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies, um, what's another area uh, that has benefited quite a bit? Um, um, technology. technology, yes, technology has, you know, and that's just, that's just the way that it worked out. There was just certain things. We were not prepared for the pandemic, but lo and behold, people saw a need and that's the entrepreneurial, innovative, part of who we are as um, in, in the United States is we see a need and we try to meet that need. And um, when you're effective and thinking of that, you know, outside the box and thinking creatively, you're going to come up with products that are going to be needed. But then again, we have another facet, another aspect where um, government and those affiliated with top leadership do also benefit um, from, from those relationships that go on there. How we benefit and how we help people on the, um, that are working, um, you know, providing our food, um, harvesting our food, 
um, delivering, as you said, picking up our trash and so forth. But we had for a very, for a period of time, none of that trash was being picked up. Um, some of the food, you know, we, we call them essential workers. Um, there's a reason why there were, and I'm, I'm sure you're referring to our essential workers who had to go to work because otherwise we couldn't, um, we couldn't uh, function as a society. And that's where many of us, you know, saw what, how hard it would be when you stop an economy completely. But I think, um, I think we were not prepared. We were not prepared for the pandemic. We weren't, we didn't know what to expect. And I think many people just saw opportunities. And when you have the opportunities, when you see the ideas, you're going to come up with products and it's going to benefit uh, many of the top person. It's not saying that, I don't think it's intentionally trying to put people at, at that are essentially working at the basic um, fundamental essential uh, jobs that are needed in our society. I don't think it was intended intentionally to put them at, at and keep them down. I just think that um, we just have to understand that we have to make sure that they have the resources, the education um, opportunities, and that we're not overburdening those people that employ them to make it difficult for them to keep them employed and be able to pay them, um, you know, competitive wages. I'm not sure I, that's a lengthy answer, but there was just, just so much to cover under the pandemic and the impact that it has economically um, with the top percenters and how it has it affected. Um, there were a lot of negative impacts and positive impacts from the pandemic. We learned a lot and hopefully we'll be better prepared um, in, in moving forward. But right now, I think California is doing an incredible job in making sure that we're investing a lot of resources towards education and making sure that we're making up for our children and our youth, our college graduates, um, and giving them that opportunity. I'm hoping that we give more incentives to help them continue on that economic ladder um, and opportunity um, pathways to um, economic success. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Oh, those, are those are great points, Senator. Thank you so Thank much. You. Next, um, I'll move uh, up. So sorry. Next, um, Philippe McAllister, we're all tour capital. Please ask. Thank you, Solange, Dolores, Gabe, and everyone at the NEA for this wonderful opportunity to hear from Senator Ochoa Bo, share her vision for California and our country at large. Uh, thank you, Senator Ochoa Bo, for sharing your life experiences as a Latina, for persevering through those many challenges that you face so that Latinas have a voice in conversations that impact, impact us the most, uh, and for sharing your thoughts on our most important questions today. Uh, Senator, after graduating from UC Santa Barbara and earning your teaching credential at UC Riverside, you taught English in high school while also becoming an accomplished businesswoman and real estate professional. With that in mind, and your study of teaching and now service as the state's first Latino Republican elected to the state Senate, how important is financial literacy to our Latino youth as a means to help them up the ladder of success, regardless of their professional choices? So I'm just gonna start with just making a couple of corrections. So I graduated from UC Santa Barbara and I went to work on my teaching credential at Cal State San Bernardino um, here locally. So I just wanted to make sure we got that clear because I know UCS, you know. Uh, my apologies. <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. Um, so financial literacy for our youth, is that okay? Essential. Yes. I've been Thank an you. advocate for financial literacy um, since I was um, in the school district here locally um, in, my, in my city. Um, and the reason being is that when we look to see the advantages that many people have is one, they know how to create a business, they how to run a business in, in California and that allows them to be helpful and successful. Um, but with our youth, the, what, the biggest concerns that I have, so is that many people are not just as, um, we're not very, um, aware of how government works by the time we graduate from high school, we also are not very familiar with the financial systems and the, having that financial literacy and how that impacts the decision-making that you make and how that affects your 
um, your credit scores and opportunities to even more, move further out. And depending on whether or not you're an uh, immigrant, a migrant, or a first, second generation, um, or even third, depends on the, in, the, in the family and, and the culture that has been fostered, many people um, that come here, especially people that are uh, migrating here, they're coming from the small little towns in, you know, in Latin America, many of them do not know about the banking system and how that works. Um, and so I truly believe that <clears throat> in order to really help our next generations and our youth in general, they have to know the basics about how the economy works, how, um, how to be financial literate, how to um, open a checking account, how, you know, what it's going to cost to, to live for housing, for um, uh, utilities, Every, all of that needs to be really taught and, and brought into um, and I would wish that every household could, could have that. But in reality, the reality is that we have so many immigrants from around the world that may not necessarily be aware of how the financial institutions work and how um, what decisions you should make in order to do that. And I'll, and I'll share that from my own personal perspective. Um, one of the things that I knew from my parents as a little kid, because I, I don't know why I remember, but it made an impact. My parents did not believe really uh, in credit cards. They believed that you should pay for everything for cash as a kid. Um, um, why I have that in my head, I don't know. But I was eight, nine years old, and I remember my parents were all about cash. They bought their first car when we moved, when we came back from the States, from Mexico back to Hawaii, they paid for their car in cash. Um, and they moved from Mexico to Hawaii uh, with two girls in tow and several boxes and luggages with $500 cash in their pocket. But needless to say, um, so that was one of the things is that, is that they believed that everything had to be paid for cash. The other thing I learned from my grandparents um, learning is when my grandmother was struggling um, in her marriage, my grandfather at the time uh, went through a phase where he was suffering from a lot of alcoholism. And um, so she was trying to figure out how to make ends meet. And, um, and she would go not to the bank to borrow money. She would go to her, um, her mother or her sister's um, family members, basically, to ask for help and money. So think about the context in which many of our immigrants or migrants come to this country, not literally, not with any experience with the, um, the financial institutions. So how do we share and how do we empower our children if we personally do not have that knowledge base? And so, um, you know, sometimes you'll make decisions. So let me go back again. Um, as a student in college, when it came to applying for grants, for loans, uh, for schools, trying to understand how all of that worked. We had, you had some information, but not really a holistic picture of what that meant. Um, I, you know, I knew that grants didn't have to be paid. This is what I knew, my basic knowledge. Grants didn't have to be paid. Loans had to be paid. Scholarships did not have to be paid. That, that was my basic knowledge on that. And one, that you didn't want to, um, you want to pay as much for it cash as you can. And number two, if you had a credit card, which when I remember getting my first credit card at the age of 18, my, my, uh, my mom said, make sure you pay it at the end of the, of the month, because otherwise you're paying interest on it. <laughs> so basic, basic things that, you know, that I had, but how many people really have those, that knowledge base and know how to work it. So I think if we want our generations to be um, successful, we must, we must include financial literacy in our high schools, maybe even prior to our elementary schools here, start off with having entrepreneurial uh, opportunities. So children starting in uh, second and third grade have to create the little businesses, and they have a market, a market um, kind of fair, where, you know, kids are given, you know, fake money, and they go and they, and they support their local, you know, local businesses for from their colleagues. So it's getting them to think that way and, and understanding how money works, using your mind of, on creating businesses um, and how that, you know, and then you go into taxes. So that was an interesting thing, teaching my children about, you know, well, taxes, or, you know, we call it the mommy tax um, on, at home when it came to, to making money. But all of that is, is just, it's, it's planting the seeds about financial responsibility. Here's another thing that I learned as a realtor. You know, I used to think, um, and this is not just, I'm, 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 I'm 
directing this information towards our Latinos, but in reality, it affects everyone across demographics um, in the United States. Because I remember, I, as I started in, in doing real estate in 2002, um, when, and I remember helping people purchase homes um, here in our, in our area, and I remember trying to teach people about just because you can afford a $500,000 home back then doesn't mean that you spend $500,000. And the reason being is you have to financially plan for um, emergencies. So you want to make sure that you allocate some money to, for, you know, to make the repairs on your home. Otherwise, it becomes dilapidated in the, long, in the long term. You have to make sure that you have some money put away in case of health emergencies or your tire goes out. So I, as a realtor, took that personal responsibility in just planting seeds on a lot of my first time home buyers because I wanted them to be empowered and make sure that they were prepared. The, the saddest thing for me was to see people living in beautiful homes and thinking, how can they afford that home and they live that lifestyle when I know my husband and I are working and we can't have that lifestyle. But lo and behold, when 2008 and 2009 came, guess who lost their homes? Guess who were the first ones to have to file for bankruptcy or just forgo of their homes? It was those individuals. Why? Because we also live in a society where uh, we want to have the best. We want to, you know, have the best house. We want to buy the best cars because we see everybody and, and we are driven towards that mindset without understanding the financial ramifications of not making wise decisions. So I remember there was an accountant who um, I was privy to who said, you know, I'm an accountant. I have, um, I, I do taxes for people who, you know, earn $30,000, $40,000 a year. This is back in, in the early, late, late 1990s. It goes all the way to make $500 million a year. And you'd be surprised how many of those individuals who make $500 million a year are still living paycheck to paycheck. Why? Because, because you have it. You're spending it and that's not the way it's supposed to be just because you have it doesn't mean you spend you have to invest and what does that take financial literacy and discipline um so i think when it comes to financial literacy the sooner the better we have retirees who are retiring on seniors that i meet with seniors and it's so disheartened to see my seniors come to you and say you know i have to choose between housing food um and medicine why? Because they thought that Social Security was a means of retirement. So when it comes to financial literacy, it goes across the board in demographics and age groups. I mean, literally, we have to do a better job as a society um, to educate people and empower them with financial literacy, starting with our children as young. There's no, I don't think, well, I guess there is, you understand money and, and the concept of money, but um, I don't think there's ever too early or too late to start informing people about uh, financial literacy and how to empower them so that they can have um, a more secure, I would have to say a more secure and stable uh, quality of life. Essential. Thank you for that, Senator. Those are excellent points. And we'd love to have you um, as a guest speaker to speak to our fellows sometime next summer. So we'll reach out to your office then. Um, next question is from David, I'm sorry, from Gabe Rodriguez, our chairman of NAA. <clears throat> Senator, it's been uh, very motivational and inspiring to hear from you. You know, just yesterday I was reading a study from McKinsey and Company that came out this year that showed that though Latinos are 18.4% of the population, 17% of the labor force, we account for 11, only 11% 11 of consumer spending, right? Primarily because the jobs that Latinos get, and this goes to your financial literacy, are lower paying, right? We don't have the professional jobs. Now we're projected to be 30% of the population in 2060. So with this in mind, in 2021, the NAA started the Pathway Fellowship Program to expose diverse, but primarily Latino youths to financial services because our industry is a driver 
that can make generational wealth. Now, not everybody will be able to do the program. I mean, I wish we could do that. But one big piece of this is the modern economy, right? I'd love to hear what you, I mean, I know you agree as a teacher that education is a bedrock, but what can we do or have you planned to do to prepare the youth for success for this modern economy? You know, simple things like in, increasing technology or the internet availability mm -hmm. of that nature so that we can compete at a level playing field, you know, as mm -hmm. those that came before us. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and your plans. So, um, yes, I've been an advocate to making sure that we have uh, broadband actually readily accessible throughout our um, our state in California. And actually, it was very enlightening to hear um, this past two years, I've only been the legislature for two years, to hear my colleagues, especially those that represent the rural farming communities and how um, we have so many gaps when it comes to broadband availability and be able to have that technology available. So right now, first, of, first and foremost, in order to be able to be successful in that endeavor, we have to make sure that we do have that broadband availability throughout our state, no matter where you live. So that's an infrastructure that is going to be very costly, but I think in the long run, it should yield greater benefits if we do that, make that investment. Um, and properly make that investment. That's also accountability. I'm all about accountability, fiscal accountability in our state because sometimes we allocate so much money and we don't know at the end where it all goes. And yet we're still, uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention really quick on that end, um, I do believe in, in education, but I also believe in quality education. Not all education, unfortunately, is um, is equal in the state of California. As, as you can see, I don't know if you're familiar, but we've had some, uh, some data and some articles that have shown that we are you know, at the lowest when it comes to reading scores um, and our math scores. So um, when we take into the, the technology gaps that we have throughout our state, we also have to focus on what we're doing that's working and not working in the state of California and really empower families to have choices when it comes to education, because not being on a school board and working in a school district, I'm the one, I'm the first one to tell you that not every child learns the same. Um, not every school district has all of the resources um, or the staff with the expertise to meet the needs of every single child, which is why it's so important to make sure that we allow our parents to have different opportunities to choose uh, the school or the type of learning that best meets the needs of their child. Um, to make sure that we have successful schools. And, um, and, and I say this because I'm very concerned about some of our schools and our, some of our districts throughout the, the state, um, including the um, advocacy that goes through our rural areas and what they're missing in, in the lack of technology um, facilities that they, they don't have in order to be able to meet that need. So um, when we talk about how do we empower our, our youth in today's economy? Let's start with the foundations, with the founding principles of quality education choice and making sure that we as a state, as a school district, um, give the, and private industry because they have to come in with building that, that infrastructure, but everybody works together to make sure that we're building that infrastructure um, in order to facilitate the quality um, learning that needs to happen in order to have success at the very end. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did answer the question. And, you know, at some point, it'd be great to be the ones writing the checks as Latinos <laughs> um, for, the, for the athletes. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. You're very welcome. I hope I address every question, every part of your question. Okay. If I don't answer your, your a specific part, please reiterate uh, on that. Sometimes I, I, my mind just keeps going and going on, on issues. And so I, I, I need to be kind of reined in a bit um, on that end. So don't be, don't be shy and letting me know. Okay, well, 
how about this particular point? So, okay. Uh, Senator, we have one uh, question from Peter Zaldivar. Hey, Senator, thank you uh, so much for um, sharing your time with us. Um, even those of us who aren't in California, I think I see many of us are, are in Chicago here, and um, but still, uh, I think I just thought it would be a good opportunity to mention that it, it, it sort of goes along with what with what uh, Gabe was saying, which is that Latinos are a big, I mean, we're a big part of the population, and yet we tend to have lower paying jobs. And so we just don't affect the economy as much as we really should. And part of the, I feel like part of the purpose of the NAA is to help, you know, bolster through teamwork and cooperation, <clears throat> the part of the those professional Latinos that are in um, investment management, or private equity, and um, and public equities, and I just thought it would be a good it would be a good thing to mention because I I, I think it's I try to mention it every time I see a um, a Latino or a Latina in this case. Um, politician, which is that lots of times governments don't really realize how much they can affect the the well-being or the, the growth potential of the Latino community through their own allocation of resources that they get from taxpayers. And so in this in this case what I'm saying is is that for instance CalPERS is one of the biggest potential funding sources of of all of our businesses and um we my own firm has been lucky because we've been um we were lucky enough to get big enough to get considered by calpers to get something of an allocation but there's a real i just wanted to let you know that that because most people don't know it that there's a chicken and egg problem or uh in in the latino finance community which is that there are, the, there are a lot of big institutions like, I mean, CalPERS is one of the biggest, but even, even among smaller ones, institutions, there's, there's this feeling that like, oh yeah, we understand that Latinos are a big part of the financial, I mean, of the, of the, of the population. And we, and we want all, we want to help raise all Latino businesses. And then they, and then we say, great. So then maybe invest some money in our, in our investment companies. And then they look at us and they say, yeah, but you manage $50 million and we, we give allocations and in, in pieces of 500 chunks of $500 million. So you're too small. So then, you know, at that point, there's, there's really nothing we can do because we can't, I mean, there just aren't any, there are just very, very, very few Latino investment managers that are big enough to be able to say, oh yeah, we can take, you know, we can actually use that much money. So, um, just as a now, now fortunately for, I'm, I'm, my investment firm manages um, public equities. Fortunately for more NAA members, there's a lot of um, private equity investment firms here, and they tend to have a little bit easier time getting allocations for uh, private equities um, from pension funds and and endowments and foundations because the check sizes usually are are it's okay to write a smaller check size, right? But anyway, I just wanted to bring it up that that I know that many of us on this call would be, we would be hiring more Latino staff to manage the money and we would be raising people up through society and we would be taking people from the position of like, oh, well, you know, I graduated um, college and I in finance and I have to work at a Starbucks to, to getting them to actually work at a, um, at a, at a place that would really be able to give them a, a, a good career path, like up to the point where, you know, if, a, if it's, if we're talking about Latino investment firms with Latino owners, then, you know, we're more likely to, to raise somebody up to that, to the upper level um, of the ownership level of, of our investment firms. And so I was really, really excited by the fact that you are a um, Republican senator because often um, we have to depend on the on people 
on um, lawmakers on the left to say, oh, well, you know, we, we really care about pushing, you know, equity, social equity. So we're going to try to get all um, uh, all minorities, you know, a bigger piece of the pie. But this is what I'm saying is something a little bit different, which is that, I mean, other minorities often have their own champions and they've done better than Latinos have in getting a piece of the uh, of that um, of that of that kind of money, and I think um, I think in order for Latinos to be more successful, we're going to need to be able to convince people from both sides of the aisle to say to the organizations that that disperse um, investment money, hey, you know, maybe you should take a second thought about um, about looking at Latino managers. Anyway, that's yeah. just a suggestion and. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm really happy. I'm, I'm just really super excited that, um, like I said, to see um, Latino uh, senators or politicians from both sides of the aisle, because I mean, that's another whole bugaboo that I'm always talking about with my friends, but we tend to get pigeonholed as, oh, like, oh, Latino voters are going to be on the left and you, know, you can't have a range of, of politics. So. Anyway, uh, those are excellent points, Peter. Uh, okay. Excellent points. It, like you stated, um, Senator is, works you know, so closely with both sides of the aisle, and she has been able to collaborate. And she was the only Republican um, sponsor to sell, uh, sponsor that legislation. So that'll take me to my last question. Um, you know, Senator, you supported the legislation to require the pension funds to disclose and uh, report who they entrust their assets with. Um, how do we increase support for these kinds of access to capital bills, irrespective to of someone's politics? And uh, I know Peter, you touched on um, sent, you know we need that champion, and being that the senator signed on to that bill, you know she can be our champion out there for us in pushing to these. So Senator, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. So I, I'm going to need a little more clarification on your on your question, Dolores. But uh, Peter, I just wanted to touch on the fact that I'm, I, I was kind of curious, and I would love to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. Um, and I could, um, I think Sarah, um, my chief of staff is, is on the call. I just want to make sure that you have access to my cell number um, and to my chief of staff so that we can do one-on-one. -on -one. You know, I'm not a financial expert. I'll be the first to tell you, but I've been blessed throughout my life to have had opportunities or books or people that have come into my life that have given me insight into how to make the best decisions. When it comes to policy, um, as you can imagine, as a state legislature, we, we legislate on so many areas and so many spaces, many of which I really don't have a lot of experience in. So I, this is where I, as a legislator, and by the way, I prefer the word legislator over politician because I see myself more as a um, as, as governing and working on legislation than I see myself as a political. Um, I know I'm a political, quote unquote, political figure, but I'm not, I guess inherently you are a politician, but I just don't like the stigma that goes under uh, under politician. And I don't necessarily fit that, that standard uh, notion of what a politician is, but I identify much better as a legislator. Um, working on legislation that works for, for Californians. But um, one of the key components in making sure that we're making the right decisions as legislator, legislatures, in my personal humble opinion, is to make sure that we sit down with those who are the experts in their fields, such as yourselves who work in those specific spaces. And when we're working with policy that affects your industry, it behooves you to make sure that you're coming to us and explaining. And this is where lobbyists have a, you know, it's a, a double-edged sword with, with lobbying, right? But in order for a legislator to really do a good work on good policy, balanced policy, we have to make sure that we speak to the stakeholders being affected by that policy. Because if we only speak to one group that advocates for the, the policy that's affecting their industry, but we don't talk about the other side or we don't sit down with the other side, make sure we understand what's working and not working with, with that particular policy. We're not going to have a holistic view of the impact 
the unintended, both intended and unintended consequences of that policy. So as we're moving forward, and as I move forward on policy, and if, you know, if I'm to be an advocate for, um, for Latinos or just for financial literacy, because I really think that any policy that I work in, it should be beneficial to all Californians. And yes, um, we, we, can, um, we can tailor the policy to meet the needs of any specific demographic based on what it is a need. But in reality, when we look at a lot of the issues um, that affect Latinos, I can assure you that it's the same policy that affects a lot of people that, are, you know, if we're talking about immigration, it's going to affect many people across demographics. So um, I can speak as a Latina because, as I said, first generation raised between Mexico and the United States. And so I can firsthand talk about the experiences of being a Latina with conservative values raised traditionally under a Latino home. Um, and living in this state, in, in, in this country, and state in, in this country. So I can, I can speak and see to that because I, I feel that. But by the same token, um, I feel compelled to make sure that I, you know, that I connect with every demographic and every group um, to see what it is working and not working on that end. Um, and then one last comment, and I'm not sure if that answered your, your question, Dolores, when it came to okay. the to the policy, but also one last point, um, Peter, on your comment, um, you said that you would be hiring more Latinos. I'm kind of curious as to why that's not already the case, or is the is it is it that the case, or is that not the case? Oh no, well it, we we hire as many as we can, but we're limited by the size of the company, and the size of the company gets limited by how much money we can get, and. A lot of right. So if we could grow bigger, then we would be, you know, we we would have twice as many people, and we'd have twice as many Latinos in the firm. Got it. And um, Peter, if you don't mind, I would love to have a one-on-one -on -one with you to get a little more insight as to how do we help that. What are the impediments that are that are inhibiting your growth um, exponentially? On that line. Yeah, that would be that would be excellent. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Great. Thank you very much again, uh, Senator, for your time. This was extremely informative. Um, thank you for your candor and um, we really appreciate it. Before we end today's discussion, would you like to make any closing remarks? You know, I just want all of us to count our blessings, to, to really count how blessed we are. And I know and I understand that we don't need policy to do what is right within our spaces and within our, our sphere and within our industries. I believe that in leadership, you know what's right, what your moral code may be, follow what is that, take the lead and um, advocate when there is a need, but always modeling and taking the lead on what needs to be done without legislation. Legislation should only be there, honestly, when people refuse to do what is right. Um, and serve as an oversight and as a protector to make sure that we all have economic opportunity and mobility. And that's, um, you know, I don't believe in bigger government. We already have too big of a government. And I can tell you, we can go over the, the messes that we have because of lack of accountability and transparency. But I applaud you for the efforts in trying to make sure that um, you're looking out for all of the Latinos in, in, in our states and um, grateful for the opportunity um, to be here with you, to share some of my thoughts and my life experiences with you. I have an open door policy. Please feel free to reach out on a one on one. We'd love to hear more about your industry, your spaces, and how I can be of service in my little, little world here in California. No, we greatly appreciate that. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you for your time. Um, and we will be in touch with your office. Perfect. And, you know, unfortunately, Solange has had an issue with her Wi-Fi, so she just wanted me to say thank you as well. So we will be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Solange. You have folks have a wonderful and a blessed week. Take care. Thank you. Thank you as well. Take care.